Amen. What a wonderful song. I'll never forget the first time I heard that song was at church camp. And I just, I fell in love with it. There's not many songs that we sing at church camp that I don't fall in love with. I just, I enjoy them all. I enjoy the devotional songs and the things that, uh, that we sing on a regular basis. And uh, most songs that we do sing, I fall in love with simply because of the messages that they have within them. And, I, and I'm excited because I've always thought of singing as, as, as one of the things, kind of a first step, a first step. And there's a lot of first steps in our lives, but I've looked at things over the last several years in my life and realized that not all the first steps are, are good first steps. We've been trying to work with Landon a little bit on getting him to walk. The other day he was leaning against my easy chair and he turned around and he saw something, he took a step, realized what he'd done and fell down. Y'all know those feelings, those first step type of feelings. That's, that's what life is all about. We take that first step, we're not sure. And sometimes we take them and we're not even aware. And that scares me just a little bit because that means that we're so engrossed in our goal or whatever it is right there at that moment that many times we just fail to, to think. We just step out and walk. However, it seems like in our world today that America has become a land of professional spectators. We do tend to have a thought process of spectating life. How many of you recognize the years that this comes in? The top left is from 1952, what I understand. The one on the right, I mean the bottom left, is 1968. Top right, 1979. And bottom, 1984. What's significant about 1984? You may remember about what was 1984 was about, the book, Big Brothers what? Watching. Big Brothers watching you. And you know, that's a sad commentary on our society today. Because it's not, you know, it's not Big Brothers watching you, we're watching Big Brother. We're watching Big Brother or we're watching Survivor or we're watching all those things that are going on and, and I mean, have you just stopped and realized that we spend a lot of our time just watching people? We get wrapped up in days of our lives. We get wrapped up in hoping for Ryan. We wonder what the edge of night is going to be about. Now some of y'all remember those. So are the days of our lives. And we stop and we think about all the TV programs that we've watched and we're a, we're a spectating society. There's so much information available at our fingertips that we don't even experience most of what we learn from it. You say, what do you mean? Well, we watch sports on television. We watch sports on the internet. And I just want you to know that I have an app on here that if the Cowboy game comes on before I'm through, never mind. We watch the news to see what's going on in the world. We're the most well-informed people in the history of the world. We have more information at our fingertips. Now with all these new reality shows that are available on Netflix, 2008 was this picture from what I understood. We can even feel like we're the ones on a deserted island we outwit, we outplay, we outlast, we think, well, I can do that. And then we get to where we have to eat those bugs. I can't do that. We want to be in the amazing race because they get to go all over the world. And then we realize I'm going to skydive. We say, I don't want to do that. We test the waters. We see that those first steps that we want to take aren't the real thing that we ought to be thinking about. We ought to be thinking about the results of after that first step, right? We get so wrapped up in thinking, hey, I want to do that. I, oh, it looks fun. I, I want to be a part of that and be the sole survivor. My luck is that I wouldn't be a survivor at all. A friend of mine told me a story about whenever he was in the army. He said there was a fellow that went, to, went in the army with him and he, and he went through you know, all of the basic training and then he went through 
airborne training. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, it means jumping out of a perfectly good airplane with a parachute, or as one person called it, a silk sheet on your back. And you float to the bottom of the earth, you know, and, and this guy went through all this process, you know, and, and he's, he's, in, he's in airborne school, and he's jumping off these platforms, and, you know, he's going down these wires, and they're showing him how to work the wires, you know, to make the parachute go back and forth, and they... And they teach them, you know, that you pull that rip, you count to 10, you pull that rip cord. And if the chute doesn't come out, you pull your emergency cord and you float down to earth and there's a truck down there to pick you up. So the guy goes and he's out on his first jump and he tells them, he says, I really don't want to do this. And they say, well, it's your job, you've got to. And he jumps out and he pulls the rip cord and it doesn't work. He pulls the emergency rip cord and it doesn't work. And he dies at the end of it. He falls to the ground and he dies and he perishes and one of the guys said, well, I wonder what his last words were. And one of the guys said, I don't know, but when he came by me, he said, I'll bet you those trucks aren't down there to take us home either. His first step was his worst step, wasn't it? And we don't think about things like that. We, don't, we, we want to be the sole survivor. We want to live through that unless we have to go back and jump out of an airplane. We want all the glory and the glamour, but we don't want to do what it takes to get to be the sole survivor. Not really. We stand on the sidelines of life and watch it as it passes us by. And too many times I think we get caught up in that. I know I do. I'm as guilty as anybody. Lisa laughed at me last night when she found my list of the premiere dates of all my TV shows that I like to tape and record and watch. I don't get to watch them all live, but I know that when they're coming on. And she was going through this. She goes, I like this one. I don't like that one. I like this one. I don't like that one. I like this. And I was laughing because... She really doesn't like any of them. Like I do. I mean, I enjoy watching them. I'm the world's worst about getting wrapped up in other people's lives and enjoying it. That's strange, isn't it? Thank you, John. For those who didn't hear him, he said amen. Really low, but he said amen. But John, that's my life. I get wrapped up in other people's lives. How they're doing. Some of you I love so much and hurt for so much, and hurt with. And I see the pain that we're going through, and I wonder sometimes, is that why we don't take the first step of getting to be who God wants us to be? It's because we're afraid of the pain. We're afraid of the hurt. We're afraid of what's going to happen. I remember whenever I was a child that my dad tried to teach me to to ride a bicycle, I kept falling, I could never do it. And finally, whenever we were over to Cousins a few days later and they had a big bicycle, I mean, one of those big ones, you know, uh, and, and I got on that thing and I couldn't touch the ground. I was, you know, riding it and they said, come on, we'll, we'll push you and you just ride. Wait a minute, you're gonna push me and I just ride? You're not gonna run along with me? And they said, no, you'll get it. Well, after about the fifth try, and a mouthful of gravel about two or three times. I did, I got it. But it wasn't easy because on those first few tries, I kept falling and it hurt. It didn't feel good. But with the encouragement of those other children that were able to ride their bikes around, it was encouraging to me to see them riding their bikes. I wanted to be able to do that. And so finally, they pushed me one time and I said, I've got to get this done. And so on the sixth try, I got on that bike and I rode it. And as I rode it, I rode down this hill in, in, in their driveway, which seemed like forever. It was probably from here to the back of the, the auditorium there. But as I was, and I was riding it, and I turned around and I said, Bobby, how do you stop it? Because I didn't know where the brakes were. I didn't know how they worked. I was just learning. And there's so much we don't know when we're just learning, when we're just starting, or when we're too afraid. We're called to go into this world and deliver a message of the gospel. Don't get me wrong, I watch some of those shows that I've talked about, I understand the intricacies that make men do what we do. The problem I see here is that too many of us Christians have conformed to the world's way of thinking instead of the Lord's way of doing. 
We get so wrapped up in those shows and so much of those and so much of the time that, that we're, we're willing to talk about those and get engrossed in the plot and the manipulation of all that's going on that we become more fans of TV reality than we are of godly reality. We're called in this world to deliver a message. Not, it doesn't mean that we've got to get up and we've got to preach a lesson. It doesn't mean that we've got to get out and we've got to hand out a tract every day or, or we've got to talk to somebody about Jesus every day. Those are good things. Do not misunderstand what I'm saying. But that's not what it's talking about. It's living a godly life. A life that God would be proud of and that we're excited about. Because it's those first steps that get us to the end. And so many times we Christians who are older, we've been Christians for 40 years and we haven't matured since the beginning. Because we took those first steps and we fell and it hurt. And there wasn't anyone there to help pick us up. There wasn't anyone there to help build us back up and encourage us. We're just not cut out for it, we think. But God tells us through his word that if we want to have that type of experience of living that godly life, it's available to us on a daily basis. I have friends and families who've, and, and, and family members who have sent applications to be in some of these, these shows, like, you know, Big Brother or Survivor, American Idol, and, and, and tried out for those things, The Voice. I have family members who tried out for The Voice. And, and, you know, to hear those stories about how it all works and, and to see how that goes and the disappointment they get when they find out that they're not going to make it. Everyone gets excited, and they, they wait for the results, and then when they're not selected, they're, they're disappointed, of course. There are those who get angry that they weren't selected. They say, I'm as good as anybody out there. And if you've ever watched American Idol, you can actually say, no, you're not. You're not as good as you think you are. Or as Simon Cowell said one time, whoever heard you is deaf. Because they, you, you can't sing. And that's what I'm afraid of whenever I, I would try to do something like that. But there are those who get angry because they want their 15 minutes of frame, fame. They become so wrapped up in being something that many times they've forgotten they are already involved in a reality show that they have a guarantee to be the finalist and win the prize in, and that's called the Christian family. It doesn't get any real than this. There is no more real situation than to be a part of a Christian family that you're actively involved with. There are many who are a part of God's family who are dysfunctional members. They're, they're, they're afraid of taking those first steps or if they took those first steps, they fell and they didn't have anybody to help them. I want you to know today on behalf of those who have fallen and haven't gotten up or didn't want to get up or didn't feel like they had anybody there to help you, I want you to know I'm sorry and I deeply apologize that you f ever felt like you couldn't get up and go back to being excited about God's kingdom I apologize I'm sorry please forgive us for leaving you like that forgive us for not being there when you needed us let us have the opportunity to to change to be more supportive to be more in line with what God would have us to do we're called in this world to deliver a message, and that message is the gospel. And that gospel is what brings men to a right relationship with God, and it is a first step. In Matthew 9, 35 through 38, Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Folks, we need to remember that we are God's reality contestants. We're in this. 
We're in this life as laborers. We're people who've been selected to work in the kingdom of God, to be a part, an active part of the family. We've been asked to give our best performance in time to cause bigger than any recording contract or any amount of money. We may never understand what it means to be rich here on this earth, but we can know what it means to be the child of the king in heaven. We may never overcome the hardship of what this life brings upon us, but we can know without a doubt that we can be his forever in a place that knows no sorrow. In a place where the telephone doesn't ring and a bill collector be on the other end. In a place where you don't have to worry about where next month's rent's coming from or how things are going at work. A place where there are no worries. There is no sadness. Oh, we have to put up with it here on this earth. Don't misunderstand. I understand. I know that. We all have jobs. We all have things to be concerned about. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. But what I'm saying is, is that this is the reality that we're in. And it's the only reality that we know, and that reality is something that we must live through. We cannot live through the reality of others. Today, we find ourselves standing on the sidelines. Sometimes we've let the world be ministers to the poor and the needy, and we've sat back and become spectators in the reality world of TV. Many Christians today are not involved because they don't know where they can be plugged into ministry. Shine groups, benevolence center, Bible teachers, Bible class attendees, missions, ladies class, children's ministry, Bible times, VBS, youth and food, you know, food ministry. You, and that's just, touching, that's just touching the hem of the garment of where you can be involved, where we need people to be involved. Some of you can do that. But so many of us are content to watch reality from our pew and watch the failures and success that go along with that and what happens in our church family. That's why we aren't growing as fast in a, as, a, as a group as we used to. And the main reason is, is because we're failing, not God, we're failing ourselves. Which in failing ourselves, we're failing God. Don't misunderstand that either. But what God wants us to do is just do what we can to take those first steps. You don't start running immediately. You ever seen a child who, who wants to run so bad before they can walk? You know, you can just see it in them. They, they want to run. They don't want to walk. They want to run. And when they start, they, you know, they're the ones with the black eyes and the scraped noses and the bruised elbows and knees. You ever met any of those? Yeah. Leslie's pointing at somebody named Thomas. I won't call his name. but You know, whenever we stop and we think about that, that's, that's who we are. Some of us want to hit the road running and some of us fall and we can't get up and we don't have anybody to help us, like I said. But these are places where we can go and find what God wants us to do. God's word calls us the church. God's word calls us the family. God's word calls us the assembly of the living God. We're commanded to go into the highways. We're commanded to go into the byways and, and minister to those who are lost and those who have needs, how do you do that whenever you, you, you can't even walk? Take that first step. Somebody asked me one time, how do I approach a friend about coming to church? I said, that's a very good question, and I've got a very simple answer. When you get up next to that friend the day after you go to worship, and they always ask you, how you doing? Say, man, I'm great. We had a great day at worship yesterday. And sometimes that's all it takes. I know a man personally who came to God and came to Jesus because one person stood up on Monday when they were asked how they were doing. He said, man, I, I'm, I, I'm doing great. We had a great day at worship yesterday. And the guy asked him, oh, really? Where do you go to church? And now that man is serving as an elder of the church the one who asked, how are you doing? Why? Because somebody said one thing. I had a great day at worship yesterday. I had the opportunity to worship my God. Man, we had a great church service. Man, we had a great meal at church yesterday. Our, man, our family day, we had our family day yesterday and it was such a great time. First steps. 
hard? Yeah. But they're ours to take and ours to do. God's word calls us the church. In Luke 10, 30 through 37, it says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. This is what Eric read a while ago, just a moment ago. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him when he went away, leaving him dead, half dead. The priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and looked, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for an extra, any extra expense that you have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. That man with that donkey and those two denarii did what he could and what he was willing to do. Many of us do not have the opportunity to do that, but many of us have the opportunity to do one thing. We don't have to pass by on the other side of the road. All you gotta do is open your mouth. All you gotta do is go by and say, can I help you? If nothing more than just praying for you. I, I, I don't know. He was a doer. He didn't pass by as the others had need. Look at what the message says in verses 34 and 35. When he said this message is an interpretation of the Bible, which or a translation of the Bible, and more a transliteration, but listen to what the thought says. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds, and then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave one to the innkeeper, saying, "Take good care of him." Didn't have to do a lot. He didn't preach to that man. He took care of some needs. And he influenced everybody that knew about it. How are we doing? We can look at all the examples of great men and women of the Bible. We can look into their lives and see how effective they were to, to, cause of this, to the cause of the gospel. Why? Because they were participators, not spectators. They were willing to take the first step. Their reality show that they were so involved in was their own lives. Look at Paul's life. He was whipped. He was flogged. He was, he was stuck in a prison more than once. Even shipwrecked. Bit by a snake. Then the three men facing certain death in a fiery furnace. We know that story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed we go. That's what you say at the end of the night. Shadrach, Meshach, to bed I go. But that, you know, we, we, we laugh about that. But we all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know that story. Why? Because we were taught it as children. But do we know the true story? They were willing to stand up even to the point of death. They were living a true reality life. The men were, these men were participating in their reality, not looking for a way out, but standing up for what they believe by just doing what God would allow them to do. And even when we fail, the Lord will still use us in the front lines if we want to be used. I mean, look at what Samson's life was like. He wasn't doing anything right. Samson was making more mistakes than, than Peter. I mean, look at his life with Delilah. It was terrible. But God still could use him as a participator when Solomon said, hey, I'm tired of this. Deborah took down an army because she was called. Look at how much this one person did for the Lord in her day. A day when it was not popular for women to lead all of these people. And so many others did this for one thing and one thing only. They did it because the fire inside of them, the passion by which they were motivated, and their quest to serve the Lord was greater than all the evil that men or the enemy could do to them. Paul and others like him didn't fear what man could do to them because they knew who their God was and the power in his hand. 
They took the call of God and they made a difference for the kingdom of God in their generation. And this is today, today, we're feeling the effects of those few because of the word of God. Think about the first century church. How much more real can it be to give your life because of your faith in an arena of lions? You think that's not reality? Yes, we've been called to do what we're supposed to do. What if we're called to give our lives instead of our time and our efforts? What would, what would we do? To die a horrific death like so many before us? Could we do that? To share the gospel with those that we come in contact with. Have we been called to do that? To participate in their lives no matter what it costs you. Have we been called to do that? To bring the good news to the lost and dying of this, congregation, of this generation. Can we, can we do that? Mark 16, 15 and 16 in the message says, still later, as the 11 were eating supper, he appeared and took them to task most severely for their stubborn unbelief, refusing to believe those who had seen him raised up. He's scolding them. But notice what he says. Go into all the world. Go everywhere and announce the message of God's good news to one and all. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved. Whoever refuses to believe is damned. You notice this? That go that he's talking about there is a command. That preach is a verb to do. And Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's time for us to do more than what we've done to everyone and everywhere. In Acts 20, verse 22 and following, but there is another urgency before me now. I feel compelled to go to Jerusalem. I'm completely in the dark about what will happen when I get there. Is that not a first step? I don't, I'm going, I'm compelled to go. I have no idea what's gonna happen when I get there. I do know that it won't be any picnic. I know it's not gonna be easy. For the Holy Spirit has let me know repeatedly and clearly that there are hard times and imprisonment ahead. It's not going to be easy. You're going to fall down. It's those first steps that we need help with. And God says, I'm there. But what matter, But that matters little, he says. What matters most to me is to finish what God started. The job the master Jesus gave me of letting everyone I meet know all about this incredible, extravagant generosity of God. Now, I think everybody would like to hear something like that. Not knowing what awaited him, he went to jail. So he said, I'm gone. I'm going to have to go to jail. That means everyone and everywhere. Right? I don't know. But in his word, he's commanded that he send us to do his will. The point is, is how many opportunities have we passed just that could have been used as witness to this gospel to someone who needs to hear it? Are we sitting in the pews today as spectators? Are we truly following the examples of those who stood for God when it wasn't the thing to do, when it was dangerous? It's not so dangerous today. Like I said, it only takes just a starting phrase. The first steps we take are or to be taken as Christians, and many of us who have been believers for most of our lives may not have gotten to that point where we've gotten out of that first step. We've not gotten out of that crawling stage. Others are so involved in watching and wishing that they were in the battle to share the gospel that they have become mesmerized seeing either the success or lack of success that they too have become spectators instead of participants. So what do we do? We have to realize these are the first steps that we're to take as Christians. What is that? Just take a step in faith. I don't know where you are this morning spiritually, but I do know this. It's time to take some steps. We all need to take them together. First step may be tomorrow when somebody asks you how you're doing, just say, man, I'm doing great. 
God has blessed me so much. Oh, wait a minute. Don't do that one because they may ask you how. Don't ask that. Don't give them that one unless you know how you've been blessed by God. Somebody may ask you, say, well, how, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Man, I had a great, had a great worship yesterday. Wait, you may not want to do that because they may ask you to tell them about it. They may want to know what was so great about it. We can have excuses all the time, can't we? The question is, is when somebody asks us how our day was and we say, it was great. How was your weekend? It was wonderful. I got to spend it with my brothers and sisters at church. What'd you do? We sang and we prayed. And some old fat guy got up and talked forever. But I talked forever for one purpose, to encourage us to take first steps. Just a first step. Respond to the question you know they're going to ask in a way that glorifies your God. Those are the first steps we need to take as Christians. The way to overcome our fear is to continue taking steps. This morning, if you need to take a step, won't you do so now?